Well, I finally circled around and done my errands enough here to get back to doing a little painting. I wanted to go ahead and stay again, as I had talked about, in one color palette. And whenever I'm speed painting, I like one color palette because obviously it allows you to just keep painting faster. This figure here uh, has a really dark brown sort of smock, I guess, is the best I could call it, on him. And very, very dark green uh, skin tone. So I've got a color set up for that, for the green skin tones, which I'll get to. But I don't think I'm going to get to it while we're doing it here, just so I don't have to change colors. Kind of some of the slowest parts of speed painting for me are the color changes when you're working in colors here. So what I, I pointed out over in my little palette here, I use these little yogurt palettes. Um, I put out four colors of paint that I would very normally use uh, when I'm doing um, just a different brown hues. So I've got a very sort of mid-range dark brown, uh, but it's not really dark. I have some really, really dark brown that I use, uh, Burnt Umber, um, or this one I think is called Van Dyke Brown. Now, again, you guys might note that I use um, Steve Kish's old paints. These are the old stuff from Michael's he used to get. Steve never, for some reason, thought there was any reason to buy the the high-end paints from the different companies. He seemed to think he liked this. He thought it was very cheap. Uh, I don't think their qualities is good, so I tend not to like them, and, and eventually I'm going to get rid of them. Uh, the problem, of course, is that I still have sort of the emotional attachment to his stuff, and I keep thinking as long as I keep using his paints, I'm, I'm sort of kind of keeping him alive, at least in my mind. And um, I've milked these paints now for well over a decade. I mean, he's been gone for 12 years, and I've been using this stuff, and I have to keep adding glycerin and obviously different types of things to keep the paints alive, but they hold together. I'm not 100% sure I'll always like their uh, their way they lay down and their consistencies and stuff, but even if the paint's thick, I use a lot of water, so it's not really a problem. But it's just, there's the little thing for the little two-headed Etten or whatever he's going to be. Here was the vampire, and I was talking about the idea that maybe I wanted to paint him brown. So instead of going with this sort of gothic, I'm going to kind of keep him in this coloration. Now, somebody chastised me that I was stereotyping medieval-style figures that they weren't all brown and that I should, you know, use up and increase the, the color palette. And I do that. I mean, anybody who's sort of seen my stuff, I, I'll go with some very bright colors, especially for fantasy figures. Um, but I kind of still like the earth tones. I like the browns. I like the greens. Um, you know, I enjoy working with them. I still think in many ways they are very much sort of the ranger est elf est sort of Albion est Celtic est type colors. Now, the only reason I'm doing this now is just to throw some color on this guy so I can take a look at it. The only thing I think I'm going to salvage from this paint scheme is going to be the flesh color, this sort of flesh green that he used. I'm going to stick with. Um, and as again, as I've showed you, I'm just painting over the miniatures. I know a lot of people who are very serious painters would never do that. I mean, they always say that you should strip it down, you know, prime it up, get it prepared, and then come at it. And I understand that. And from a technical point of view, I agree. But again, as I said, I think there's more here. And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but I always think there's more in miniatures than just the paint. You know, there is the history, the fact that somebody did paint on this thing. I mean, whether it was good or bad or whether I think one way or another, I mean, they put some effort in this thing, and I never want to discount that. I always want it to be out there. I, I sort of sometimes feel that at some point in the future, and it's because I've been to a lot of museums and I've been to a lot of people's personal collections, things end up eventually becoming historical and acquiring an artistic stance to show you what things were like at whatever period. And I had somebody who was into like, cigarette boxes and match boxes and different types of art. And you're amazed at how much work and detail goes into a lot of these things. Now, I just slopped some paint on there just so I can start to see if I'm actually going to like this. Um, I have to be careful because I always like, put it on thin. I could get to a point where I could make it too, uh, too thick for me to continue on. Uh, I don't worry about it as much with D&D Zero figures. They're, they're sort of crude to begin with, so it's not really a big problem. Um, I still going back and forth on this chest piece of this young lady here for this ranger, but I think I'm going to leave the, the concept that they were working on, which was to make it 
uh, sort of a, a brig, brigantine style armor or some kind of like middle weight armor, like uh, leather with, you know, brass or metal uh, plates put upon it. And it was not an uncommon type of armor and I'm going to stay with it. The cleric, of course, you know, is going to stay these. So what I wanted to do once I have this down is get off of this color and start to go to the light colors. The dry brushing and wash technique I do for speed painting is very old school. It's obviously been done. Many people stick with it. I highly recommend it for putting things done quickly. If you want to be a golden demon painter, you know, you're going to end up eventually doing all kinds of brush strokes and things that are individual. But basically for getting things ready to go on the board, there's nothing like, you know, just basic good dry brush. Uh, and wash. The dry brush and wash combination works great. Again, I, he already had brown on this. I don't have to go with a, a darker color. I have some issues here with brushes. But I have about 100 or so, so I can usually keep at it. This is a little minifig monk. Um, somebody, I, as I showed you, added a, added a, um, a balsa wood shield to it. And I, at this point, um, the rub and buff is very much like I look at um, dry brushing. The idea is to get as little paint on as you can. You know, you, you keep it rubbed down. That's why if you a lot of times you'll see me using a, a blotter of some sort, um, you'll see it's covered with different paint from previous dry brushes. Dry brushing older figures is not always easy. They're not usually as distinctive Often right now, I find dry brush should be really excellent on more modern figures because they give you enough detail that you can grab with the dry brush, but not so much as that you you milk it up or you, you gaff it up. And as the minifig figure shows, it's much tougher to get it to lay down exactly how you want it. If there's no real high areas necessarily to pick up, these figures are very small since they are 225s. In some cases, you might even find figures down in the 20. And there's not a lot of detail for the dry brush to grab. So what ends up happening often, as I feel, you end up getting too much dry brush on and then you're going to go back. But that's where the washes come in. A lot of times early on in the 70s, a lot of people would paint and dry brush, and there really wasn't a wash. People didn't really cop to the washes as much. They didn't know there were inks available. Uh, if they did know, they were expensive, so people might not necessarily want to use them. Now, I don't know how much close we can get here. You can sort of see now I've changed the total color of this now much lighter. You can still see the darker areas, but now you can see the dry brush has really lightened it up. That's what I want, because what is going to be always the determining factor in a good speed paint for me is when you lay down the wash. Now, I always like to use ink washes. Uh, they've been around for a long time. They weren't real well known in the miniature painting world as much, uh, because most people were always, again, when you're painting miniatures, uh, trying to get it done quickly. Now, here on his staff, where you can see there's some major scratches here. Uh, I'm going to try to straighten it out a little bit. Lead is very soft. It's very malleable and very easy to modify. Um, the only problem it has is if you, once you've modified it, bent it too much, which happens a lot when you're using it and playing it because being lead, it is soft. Uh, you'll often bend things around and eventually things snap off. That's when, when you guys go on eBay and people are asking me, where do I get a lot of my old figures? Um, often I have a lot of old friends who played and they have figures and they don't play D and D anymore, or if they do, it's it's irregular, and they would love to just play with me or someone else. I can go through their stuff and find old figures. Uh, they'll give them to me usually because if they're not making a real collection of old figures, the old figures are obviously not anywhere nice, as nice as um as the modern figures are. There are really a lot of beautiful, beautiful figures getting produced. I mean. My buddy Matt always said that he thought that this was a real uh, renaissance in gaming that we have now. Um, now the staff is fixed. It'll, of course, get a dry brush as well. But again, the thing is, as you can see with the advantage in one palette, you just keep moving. Dry time is often some of the longest part of any miniature is the time between obviously slopping some paint on it and getting it dry enough that you can go back and do something else. This little archive wear bear. Um, terrible figure in my opinion, humble opinion. I mean, it's just my humble opinion. But what was nice about it, uh, it's really easy to dry brush. They are so very big 
on all their highlights here that you can you can literally see it now. Now somebody maybe did some dry brushing on this a while back and that looks like basically what they did is they just threw a little bit of dry brushing on it to big up the high spots and that's it. The advantage I do with what, like I said, the dry brush and wash technique is you can really get into the dry brushing. You can change the tonal color constantly with either how much dry brush you put on it or how much wash you put on it. Now, in this case, I'm, I'm you're going to see that it's, it's adding a lot of light color. Um, there is some flash here, which normally I would cut off and remove. And I'm finding I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, as I see it, I don't like it. I thought I got most of it. Um, not an uncommon thing when you get old figures. A lot of times they're, you know, they were made in, in old spin molds and stuff. And the technology was nowhere near as good as it is now. So you had figures that would vary within the same run. So it could have been an early Ral Partha, or late Ral Partha, you know, minifig any of these, even archive, and there's going to be flash. And often the flash is hard to remove because I have some mummies over here, which I think I showed you guys in a previous video. They're getting ready to get painted and they had horrendously bad flash lines on them. So I have to kind of, you know, work and, and cut. And the problem is since I don't care for them that much, you know, it, it's one of these things that I, I, I don't know if they'll ever get onto the paint table because I don't know if I want to do the work. Now, in his case here with this bear, going back to the washes and stuff, he's going to get a much um, darker wash. I have a dark brown wash, which, uh, excuse me, dark brown ink, which I'm going to use for him. Uh, the dark brown will make all it drop down. There are all kinds of different ink colors you can get. Really, Games Workshop makes a bunch of washes and stains. There's so much. You can even go to Art Supply. There's so many inks out there that you can get and use. They go by different names, washes and stuff, but basically they're inks. And what normally is meant by the inks is that they have a really good pigment density. So even though you thin them down dramatically, um, you're going to still get very high coverage so that you can really fine tune the, the colors you want going up and down uh, by the dry brush and wash. And the thing about it is, if you were willing to spend the time, and usually I am not when I'm speed painting figures, I'm going to do a mediocre job and call it good, put it in the box so somebody can use it. The great part about that is, obviously, I can use this. I didn't have a wear bear of any magnitude until now. And when this guy gets done, I'm very inclined to make a wear bear encounter, or even just a giant bear, if you don't want to use him as a wear bear. Um, so I can put that figure on the board. And once you do all the things, you get the pieces out there, you make it look good. There's the thing as I call table distance. I mean, what you're looking at here through this camera where they stand is about as close as you could ever get. I mean, you're not really going to, you know, reach down and pick somebody's character up and look at it and go, oh, how detailed, you know, did you get it? Now you can ask them and obviously most people will do that. Um, they'll let you look at their stuff because most people are proud of their work. And even if it's, even if it's quick work, there's a real skill to this that you'll get. And I always tell people, learn my sort of dry brush wash technique. And once that's done, you then want to start establishing your own style. You know, how do you move from that? And I used to teach a lot of people when I had my shop, you know, how to paint. And a lot of people, you know, learned it and moved on. Like John DeShazer, uh, he worked for me many, many years ago when he was about five. No, I, I think he was like 14 or 15. I ended up teaching him how to drive a car, or at least help teach him. Um, he now surpasses me. I mean, I've seen his painted work recently. Uh, he's also in the gaming industry, so he stayed in, in he was able to, to make a living doing exactly what he wanted, which I was so proud of him for. He DMs. He's got kids now who are second generation gamers. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think like Matt, he followed his true path and got the life he wanted, where, you know, I, I copped. I mean, I do a lot of the things. I love my hobby. I spent inordinate amounts of time with it. And until, but until I had my shop, I made my living, you know, doing real world packaging, POP displays, steel. I had real, real job, you know, selling people products. And I liked it. No, nothing go wrong. And it made good money for me. So I have no complaints. Um, but I somehow kind of wish that maybe I had had an opportunity to get involved more in gaming. And then again, after owning three retail shops and having them go bust and things like that, maybe not. Maybe I've always been better off just being a truest and staying with the hobby. This is nice getting on here. And I know a lot of people try to make the internet now a business. 
And I had to come to some decisions, you know, since it was unlikely that I was going to be spending that much time with Matt. I mean, he just was too darn busy um, to throw me a bone. He had to get his own stuff done because he is a business, employing people and getting all those things going on. Um, you know, that I was likely not going to make this a career. Uh, so for quite a while, I've been banging around, obviously doing things to keep going. Now this here, you can see this was already really, really light. And so, you know, again, you want to light it up. This is where I brought the ivory. In some cases, I might have even brought in white. But this ivory, which I use like as a base coat for skeletons and stuff, worked pretty good for this. And now, instead of doing dry brushing, which you're, you're noticing I'm not doing, I am going into a little bit of brush work. And this is sort of when, A, there's very difficult to dry brush this figure, or you're trying to then mix colors in a much smaller area. Now, the person who painted this sort of painted the interior cloak and, you know, scabbard, sorry, excuse me, the, I uh, can't remember the name of what they call the the uniform that goes over the guy. But anyway, his, his basic underling robes, let's go with that, should be a different color than the cloak, than the outer cloak that he's wearing. That didn't happen here. They used the same color. Then they went for this green underneath. So there was some kind of like secondary robe underneath it. And that works. But I will likely with washes and maybe a little bit more dry brushing, change the tone on both of these so that we'll have two tones of brown, very close, plus then the green and the like. Um, this guy has taken some actual metal damage here. He, his finger has gotten all the paint knocked off of it. I'm going to throw a brown on it now. And then what I'm going to do, since there are other scratches in his flesh, is I'm going to come back with a different upper flesh dry brush and not dry brush him. This figure's so small, you could never really get in here and dry brush this amount of flesh. But I will brush stroke in some flesh colors, lighter flesh. Um, and then I have, um, and then I'll make a, a wash, uh, ink wash to basically come in and add in the low line details. And that is still, like I say, is the, is the way to go. You know, once you get those techniques, you can always throw them away down the road. Same with this one here. This little female is, is really pretty nice. And in many ways, I kind of leave her alone. I don't know though, whether I, when I come back and do a little flesh dry brush, I might not want to pick up a little bit more detail and give her another wash. I don't know. And, and the reason I'm, I'm vacillating on this is I like this little figure. I mean, I like the work this person did. I mean, there there are some problems and some things that are, were never quite completely finished, but they might have just had a limited amount of time to get it done and throw it on the board. So I don't really want to do much of my own onto this figure. I'm going to uh, darken the, the little metal color so it won't look as stark. There'll be various ink washes on of brown and I'll do a little bit on her hair. I might put the skirt here, which is sort of black right now, but I don't know why, unless it's supposed to be an extension off of the chest piece. Um, I'm thinking about maybe making that green so it'll match her hat. Um, and then that might get some more color into the figure too, so it won't be quite as drab. Um, I'm still, I'm leaning that way, I don't know. I, you know, they, they, always when they're painting, you're making, you're making choices. And the other thing I ended up learning many years ago is not everyone sees as well. You know, you've got a lot of guys who are, have various levels of colorblind and they, what they see, um, may not be quite exactly what it is. Now there are feathers here, the little, uh, feathers on the arrows and they hadn't been given any color. So I'm going to put a little darker Brown right now. And then I'm going to go back and touch it up with some either lighter Brown or something else that makes it look like more a bird feather, not real flashy. I, a lot of times in the seventies, um, I would use bright colored, uh, third feather. Cause I, you know, I got a three feather arrow. Usually the two of them are, are one color and then one is the guide feather and it is the one that's brightly colored. So you put it on the outside and thusly not have it bash into the bow or your arm. And, uh, that's fine. But that was modern arrows. I mean, that's because I was a young man in college taking archery and, and all the arrows had I had fired had had that coloration. So for some reason, I sort of thought that maybe is how it should be. Um, when I saw a lot of historical arrows, of course, they're very drab uh, and it's a very, a very different concept. Now, that's it. I mean, for what I basically done now, I have given you the, the standard little base coat of dry brush. Now, the thing about, I say again, staying in one palette, is we have now done all that work with those little guys. We can go back to our little Etten here and all his brown has dried. And this is again, the point. You just keep coming at it. And that's why I tend to work in between usually three to 10 figures, just depending. I find five usually is the number you know, that I, I tend to be happy with and work with it. But if you're, see what I'm doing here is I'm just taking the, the 
you know, the palette that I'm using, mixing the various browns, and then staying with the color palette of what I put in as a color here, and just going in and doing a little bit of dry brush. Now this guy's hair, uh, I, I think it was, he painted it brown. Maybe he, did, he painted the whole thing green first and then came back with it later, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of tempted uh, because it's gonna be a very dark uh, green face. See, I got some brown on the flesh. What um, also I tell people is when you are putting on base coats, I have the old slop it on mentality. Don't worry if you paint over something that you didn't want. You can always come back at the end and cut in all the special details. And that usually is one of the other, I would say, big secrets I use. But it's, it's basically dry brush, wash, and then once I get all the colors I like perfect, you go back in and cut in the, the very super detail, if there's any that you want to cut in. You know, monsters are, are fabulous because usually they're very, very simple. And you can just you know, bash it out. I think he's got some boots. Yeah, it appears he has boots on. So we're going to add a little more brown to these boots. And the reason I like to do the highlights up like that is, in this case, you're not so much changing tone as you are basically sort of adding wear. So with boots, you can be more dramatic with your brush strokes. And in places where the boot might be high or it might be a wear spot that you think that, you know, that it would naturally wear, uh, you can just leave it. But the wash will, again, fix all that. And even if you can see it now, you can start to see that there's more color, more definition. It's not a beautiful figure. The only thing about this figure, as I stated in the original, was I have no idea what it is. And I have no idea if it's a rare figure. I mean, I may be looking at a figure that is, you know, maybe one of the few around. I never remember seeing one. And I sure saw a lot of figures over my day. So we're all good now. The vampire... Again, as I said, I think I'm going brown, and I think that's going to work because right now I think what I'm, I'm doing is I'm going to end the gothic concept. Even though he's going to have the really cool sort of vampire stock look that everyone's familiar with, the fact that I'm doing him in brown and then I will not have a, he won't have a white shirt and he won't, and then the cloak will maybe be some other different kind of brown. Maybe I'll make it dark green. He'll look very woodsy, and that I think will make him look more medieval than gothic uh, or modern. Uh, and that's what I wanted. I, I just, I've seen this figure so many times. It was a very, very popular figure from Ralph Partha. I, it was like the only time I think anyone had ever produced a vampire at that point in time that was worth having. And uh, a lot of people had this figure. So when you ran into a vampire in 1976, 77, it was very likely going to be this vampire. They were out. At this point, Ralph Partha was getting a name of being really some of the finest miniatures out there, and they were. And they were still really reasonable. Um, archive were, were not quite as good, but they had some interesting things. Uh, but they were a little expensive. Uh, but there were still lots of these little fledgling companies trying to get them up there and find a place. And miniatures were always very, 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 very cheap, um, really until Games Workshop got into the market. You know, when Games Workshop started coming to the United States and they were selling figures regularly, a foot, you know, individual figure, a uh, humanoid figure might be a dollar, a dollar and a half going up from there. That price kept climbing quickly. They were able to raise the price of miniatures really fast. And I'm not necessarily thinking that was a bad idea. The, the reason being, I think it allowed for better quality. I mean, I always tell people, if you can buy figs, buy the best you can. Uh, there are some great companies. I've, I've done mentioned them on Twitter. I've mentioned them, I think, even on, on, on items where you can find guys who are just individual sculptors online and they make some beautiful figures, really fabulously beautiful figures. Small numbers because they are, you know, a small company making, you know, a very few of their product. Their prices tend to be substantially higher. But... If it's something you want, I think it's worthwhile spending a little extra money for a character. I mean, I see a lot of things with Reaper now, and sometimes I uh, was asked to paint uh, a Reaper wizard for uh, a friend of mine in my in my pad group. And, you know, I asked him what colors he wanted, and he told me, and I was like, oh, my God, not colors I would have picked. But it was very interesting doing the figure in purples and the like. It made a, a very interesting uh, appearance that I didn't necessarily expect. Now, this thing here, you might notice he did one green arm and this arm didn't, didn't completely make it green. So what I'm doing is, as I had mentioned, I'm doing the darker color, or in this case, I'm doing it dark. I'm doing the secondary brown underneath the cloak. And then I'm going to make, leave that, the back of the cloak the same color. 
And that's, you know, kind of a style thing you might see now if someone had a cloak. They might have a cloak that matches part of their gear, um, but the backside of the cloak is always going to be something different. So there's one arm. And I shouldn't have done that. Oops. Oh, well, I'll have to go back and redo that because that arm I want light like the uniform. That's part of this. I had botched it up here. Um, and that happens a lot when I'm painting. I find that I make so many mistakes. Sometimes they're very happy accidents and you get some stuff that you really like and sometimes they're not. So, anyway. Anyway, so we'll play with a little bit of this more. Now, I'm running long on time. I don't want to make this video ridiculously long because then they get boring. And frankly, things like this, you can pass knowledge on without hopefully boring people to death. Let me find, I should have pulled it out. I didn't. Let me find, this is interesting. This is a very old, very old Citadel dark brown ink wash. And it is really dark. And I used it a lot um, because at the time it was one of the few I had that was this dark. But what I was able to do, and I know what you'll be able to do, is you can keep lightening things up. But for this bear, who I kind of want dark, I'm going to use this. And this is very old. There's not much of it left. I'm surprised it hasn't given up the ghost already. I'm flipping my thing over because I don't want to get it mixed in with paints. And then, because the inks will, will obviously surrender their, their, their items. So, as I said, when you're looking at inks, you can even see as I'm thinning this down, it's still holding its pigment density. You have not seen this thing turn into water. If that was straight paint, you know, any of the paints from here, you would start to see it, you know, becoming semi-translucent here, where you could sort of see through it, even transparent at some points. But as you see, I keep adding water. It doesn't go anywhere. It still stays as this brown. And that really great. It allows you to do things and keep them um, at a really inexpensive level. Because sometimes these inks are expensive, but you're going, they're going to last forever. This this ink's got to be it's got to be nearly thirty years old. It's surely close to that. It's more over, well over twenty years old. But now you can see it. I, I'm hoping it'll start to show up as I put it in here. It obviously flows into all the deep places. It also changes the tonal quality above it of the item that it was on. Um, it is very dark brown. Really, I would I would tend to think it's a a Van Dyke type brown where it's almost even looking black at some points. It's a good color. I, I like it. I've, I've liked it for years. Um, I found a lot of things to sort of kind of replace it, but I never thought they did the, the, the job as well as this ink did. And, you know, I, I, I like I said, it, it, you got to give credit where credit is due. Games Workshop realized that painting with inks was going to be really something. And now I believe some people keep talking to me about their whole custom line of, of different types of shades where it's a whole system. Now, again, he overpainted the tongue a little bit. So I went in with a little darker ink just to darken that down. And I will likely come back and maybe work, make it up and work on it. And the only other thing I'm going to do is, you know, the nose uh, and then all the little claws that you really can't see because uh, they're hard because of the way the figure has been sculpted. And in many ways, uh, just the colors of the paints. But there you have the basic concept of a dry brush and a wash. And now the bear is dark-ish. Um, it looks much more dark uh, under than in reality than it does in the camera. And I think that's due to uh, the amount of light that it's getting poured on it right now. Um, but either way, if, if I'm not happy with this, I can always wait for it to dry and then come back and put a darker and put another wash on it. And I can conceivably put an ink wash on multiple times. Now, you'll see me saying ink and wash. Normally, it's entertaining, you know, interchangeable for me. And the reason is um, I started out basically without inks. All my early figures in the 70s, I didn't have inks because I didn't know about them, one. And if I did know about them at all, I... I, uh, I didn't want to spend the money on them. They were they were pretty expensive. But at the military shop where I worked, the artists used to come in a lot and they would show me what they were able to do with the inks. And I had seen what Tim Finkus over at the Warhouse had done. Tim Finkus was one of the best painters I had seen at this time. Uh, he was really incredible. He, he did ink washes on metals. He did things that I had never seen anybody do. Things I now 
do all the time. Um, and so I used to call it the Warhouse style. Actually, I call it the Tim Finkus style. But all the people who painted figures over at the Warhouse, I think, even to this day, um, have adopted his style of painting. Sad to say, he's been gone for quite a while now. He was a young man, and he died way too young, very sadly. But all the people who went to work at the Warhouse, because they were hobbyists and, and whatnot, um, they learned from the other people about how to paint miniatures, and since they were using his style, um, it lives on. I wish pe more people knew that it was him, but that's, I think, always in life. There are lots of people who have added immeasurable val value to this hobby, um, who you'll never know about. You'll never hear about, um, you know, and that, sadly, is the way it is. It was like I said about Lee Gold. I mean, there was a time in the very early part of Dungeons and Dragons that Lee Gold had taken her fandom magazine and turned it into really role-playing D&D &D type thing and, and, and fantasy and for allowing people to make rules modifications and the like. And it was this thing where everybody would photo, you know, mimeograph, I guess, at the time, where they would basically just produce a page or so of product. They would then send it to her. You know, since I got this high-level brown out, I'm just going to keep using it, even though I normally would not have gone after this priest with it. But I'm going to try and again, a lot of times trial and error. You hope for that happy accident. What's going to for sure happen is it's going to make it a lot darker. So what this figure will eventually, the browns will be much darker than if I had used a lighter, uh, more contemporary brown ink. Or just if I mix the colors for sure, you were going to get a lot more. Now here's, again, sort of part of the happy accident. And I don't know whether you'll be able to see it sufficiently. When, let me get you to, right in here, you're, you're getting a place where the inks are flowing down into these crevices of his robe and giving you much more detail. Now, I'm going to keep this up all the way. I'm going to go all the way around it. I'm going to go into the green because I don't really care. I'm going to come back to the green later. And sometimes you even, and I've used this before like this, you even go after the little fleshes just to see what you're going to get. Now, I'm really throwing a lot of water on it with the flesh because I don't want uh, to, to totally change the tone. Um, but it goes into the low layers, so it gives you, um, and then I'm doing it on the hair, so it'll go into the low areas of where the hair is and give you some definition, because these figures are really lacking. Totally forgot about the fact that he's got uh, a little monk bald spot, you know, shaved into the top, so we'll be able to accent that, but I will go back then and, and give you flesh tone on that. I like it. I mean, I like this brown better than I thought I was going to like it because the darker brown gave us better contrast. Once I put the green in and the like, uh, I think it's going to be fine. I'll then do a little, obviously, dry brush on the staff and then do more likely the same thing. Don't know what I'm going to do so much on the shield. The problem with it is it's balsa wood. Uh, it's, yeah, I don't have a lot of options of, of repair. I mean, it's just what, so what I did is I did a, mostly water, just a little bit of ink on the front. So it kind of pulled out the balsa wood grains a little bit. Uh, and that's kind of what I wanted. I really wanted it to look like somebody just hacked a piece of a tree off and decided to make it their shield. Um, not bad. Not bad all the way around. I mean, it's sort of kind of working. And I, I got to tell you, if once I put the green on this, if I had produced this figure in the 70s, I would have been whoa happy with it. Because there weren't a whole lot of monks. And it doesn't look really bad at all. So now going back to our other little priest... Uh, here, where I had the little darker cloak, I'm going to use the lighter wash for the inside before the outside of his cloak. I'm going to use this brown ink that I that I dug out of the the regime for me, and it's and that's it. You just you're obviously going to draw it in. You want it to form a line, you, but you don't want the line to be necessarily too stark. Uh, you can on some figures. A lot, a lot of times with like undeads and stuff, I want things to be much more stark, but often with um, you know, different figures, I don't want that. So, and then the inside of his cloak here, going down it. And again, if you make a mistake, don't panic. Just keep painting. The The thing is, I see a lot of people who get frustrated, and I've done that too, where it, it didn't work out. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep it here in the, in the light for you because I'm not watching the camera. So I'm not 100% sure where it obviously is everywhere. And then we'll flip it over. Again, staying with the very, very watered-down ink. 
because you can always add more, or I guess the old adage, you can, it's easier to add more than it is to take off paint. Now, I don't, a lot of times this will work. If it was an undead, I would leave all this brown here because it would make sort of a real dirty look. But since it's not, I'm going to scoop out most of it. So it keep, it'll it'll still make the, the definition, which I'm going to want. But I don't want it to look like um, that it's a ruined old cloak. Now, a lot of thing I might do on this afterwards, once I, I throw the wash on it, or maybe I would say, you know what, I'm not sure. So I'm going to throw it a little heavier. You can always come back with this light brown afterwards and do a secondary dry brush just on the highlight areas. Or you could, you know, actually just brush paint it. There's so many ways to repair it and so few ways to really mess up your figure. I mean, it, the, you know, the adage I always say is you let the figure paint for you. It'll do most of the work. The detail that's in there um, is pretty easy to get out if you just let it do so. And there we have... Uh, the basics and where I, I will more than likely make more changes is now that I noticed it again. And you do this when you're painting, especially when you're speed painting, you're going to find things and that you're doing, you did wrong or not right. I didn't get this inside arm piece to match. So I've done it now and we'll go from there. There's also a technique called wet painting. I'm sure some of you, especially if you're doing pro paint type work, have heard about it. Uh, you basically are working with paints that are very wet. It's like using oils almost. And that was something I had dabbled with many times early on. When you're wet painting, you're, you're putting it on again while it's still moist. And you can get the colors to blend really, really well. And it's a nice effect. Again, it's all a matter of what you want. Going back to our little, our little bard here. Let's go back, flip over to the inks. Now, you can see now that this ink has actually become pretty much water. It's really, at this point, lost all of its pigment, but it's okay. Now, our little girl here, the, the person didn't necessarily stay within all within the line. Some things of the boot overflowed um, onto the leggings, on the legs. So, you're going to end up having to do some touch-up. And we'll be doing that constantly. But as you'll see, all the, the figure, because of the rough detail work on it, grabs up the colors and makes you uh, a fairly significantly decent looking uh, boot. We've got a little wooden shield on the, on the inside. So we do the same, throw the, the brown in there. That one, I don't mind letting sit really thick because uh, it'll make the grooves, the little indentations of the wood grain uh, come out. Somebody actually hand painted some scroll work a little bit here. Uh, uh, there was, you know, I don't know how much of it you can see, uh, but it's not bad. And then we're going on to the bow, the brush. Brown is a good color to add in thin nations everywhere. It used to be a lot of people, like my friend Steve, started out originally painting by he would put a black border between each color. I mean, that was how he learned. And we painted together for a lot of years. I liked it. Um, but as we painted together, he became envious of the fact of what I was able to do uh, with substantially less work. So he started copying my style. And I, in many ways, tried to copy some of his style. So when you paint, if you can paint with people who you like and you, you have um, faith in, uh, you're going to end up with it. Don and I paint a, a bit now and again when we can. Uh, time and distance is always a problem. Um, and life, things get in the way. Uh, it was much easier when we were starving college students. But I kind of liked, like I said, this figure really, really kind of pleased me. So I want, like I said, I want to do is darken this the silver up here a little bit. Um, so I'm going to sort of keep working on this. Again, I haven't still decided on if I'm going to do anything with this little skirt that she has. Um, like I said, I wish they had made it like a full set of armor or if it went down farther, uh, like to her boots, I think it would have been a little cooler. Um, but again, this is the mentality of the time. You know, people paint what they know. And, you know, if you ever doubt that, watch Star Trek. You know, you'll be amazed how short the skirts are on all these officers, the <laughs> female officers that are on the Enterprise. You know, and, and that was because the people who were paying, writing the paychecks to determine, you know, what was going to get made and how it was going to get made said, I want to see more leg. Uh, well, that that is unfortunately the nature of the beast. And, you know, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Obviously, I, I think that being happy with what your partner looks like is good. 
Um, but then that may date me. So maybe I should just be quiet about that. Um, there's where we're at. Again, I'm, I'm happy here. What I'm going to do real quick, just because I want to see it, is I'm going to throw the brown wash on this white. And that's really just to knock down the sheen of it and to see if I can begin to see if I'm going to like what's going to happen. And, you know, I kind of think I will. I'm just debating if whether I want to put a dark green, which I think I might start with, um, on it. God, I'm so sorry. I keep looking. When I finally can look over the camera, I realize I keep pulling back towards me instead of staying out here where it's more of a field for you guys to look at. But there we go. I've done a lot more time than I surely wanted to. I kept you guys here for a long period. Um... But go ahead and watch what you can on this and, again, learn. Now, again, if you might notice on this thing, it really, to me, looks very dark. Um, I kind of think I'm going to like it. And even if I don't really like it, I think I'm going to kind of leave it. That's, again, because of this old ink. Uh, it was just called, not brown? <laughs> I don't know. It's been, like I said, I've had this thing for so long that it uh, it's become an old friend now. I, I I have these things like Steve's paints and my old paints, and I just cannot bring it to myself to toss them, even though I've got two boxes of brand new paints sitting here. Anyway, um, I'm going to start finishing these up. What I will do, if you guys follow me on Twitter, I will take a picture, and eventually when I'm finished with all these, they, you will see the finished result on my Twitter page. Um, I'm trying to do another video today on actual how to game and things, things going on. I got an idea in my head I want to kind of maybe see if I can get out verbally for you guys but paint you know i mean in this time of uncertainty in this time of being stuck i have found that nothing keeps you well motivated to talk to your friends and show them what you're going and plan for when things get better uh to get your original games going again so until i have a chance to speak with you again fight me devils fight for i hate peace paint on